Good morning again, everybody. Thank you and welcome to TWIST 2021. Um, this next presentation, we actually have three different speakers that are going to talk with us about our radiation mod uh, modeling product called RSIM. Um, the first person you're going to hear from is Peter Nielsen. Peter Nielsen, his title there doesn't quite reflect everything that he does um, as an application engineer. He is uh, he works with our clients. He's helped with developing our SIM. He was one of a huge part of it. Um, and he's also helped with our other pro uh, products that we have. So um, after Peter speaks, we will have Arpad Lenard and Srihari Sivan <laughs> Sivasakaran. I probably said that horribly. Um, but they are actually going to give you a little background on them. Our Pat is pursuing his PhD in physics at the University of Strathclyde in applications of plasma weak field particle accelerators. He actually just graduated um, with his bachelor's degree uh, in physics with first class from the University of Strathclyde uh, this spring. Um, Srihari is currently working as a research assistant at the Center for Quantum Technologies at the National University of Singapore. Uh, he received his master's uh, in physics at the National University of Singapore in 2020 um, and a bachelor's in mechanical engineering from the University of Nottingham in 2017. So we have quite the crew to speak with you today and I'm very excited uh, to hear what you guys have to say. All right, Peter, all yours. All right, so as Colin mentioned, I'm an applications engineer and developer with TechX and the goal of this first part of this presentation is to give an introduction to what RSIM is, particularly for some of our vSIM users more familiar with our flagship product. RSIM is a product that we've recently launched and we have now up to RSIM version 3.0. And so just to give a little bit of background on the TechX Corporation, as I'm sure a number of you are familiar, it's founded in 1994 by John Kerry and Sveta. Um, it's dedicated to computational physics, research and software development. We have a highly technical team with vSIM, our flagship product. vSIM is a secondary product uh, handling CFD for plasma simulation. And then RSIM is a Monte Carlo simulation tool uh, used for radiation modeling. So what RSIM really is ideal for is taking some existing radiation transport codes and integrating them to work very well with highly complex CAD geometries, as well as providing manipulations on those CAD geometries in order to enhance studies. Now, this product was originally developed in collaboration with NASA. Uh, what NASA was finding is particularly you can see this is an example module, something they were working on with these very large cat uh, geometries. They were wanted to study shielding, particularly shielding on deep space missions, things like uh, what can happen to electronics when they're getting bombarded by electrons in the orbit of Saturn. And particularly with something like that sort of project, you can imagine sending a probe all the way to Saturn is quite expensive. So if you can get the shielding as thin as possible while guaranteeing that the electronics will stay safe, that's very valuable to them. So they came to us to help develop this product, to help make it easier to figure out what exactly is necessary for a shielding. Now, as it so happens, this is also useful for particle accelerator physics, things like radiation detectors, our shielding design on a nuclear reactor. We even have applications in medical technologies, things like proton therapy. It's quite similar to be attempting to target a tumor with the beam as it is trying to protect electrons from beam, although you do have slightly different goals. should also mention here that RSIM is the underlying engine is called Jayant 4. Uh, Jayant 4 is a, a project out of the EU uh, that's been in use for quite a while. It originally developed at CERN um, and we've been used, we were able to take advantage of some of the backlog of the validation of Jayant, but use it in a new product in a lot in that way allow you to run simulations that you couldn't before. Because if you are not familiar with Jayon, one of the things that we don't have to do is write any C++ code. 
a traditional JOUNT simulation is actually all written in C++ and compiled. Uh, similar other radiation transport modeling codes will have things like input decks and input cards, actually a throwback to reference of punch card computing. We don't have any of that. We have our standard composer workflow that you've seen in vSIM. It looks quite similar in rsim with the ability to import CAD as well as GDML, GDML being the file format used by JOUNT4. We can then edit any of those shapes, heal them, and the healing is particularly important with CAD objects. You can imagine if a triangle is missing, we can put it back. We have about 700 materials built into our library. And with our materials creation engine, you can in fact create any material that you would like. There's a wide variety of particle sources available, you know, uh, with different specification options, which we'll get into a little bit later. We have the ability to run tallies or scores are the two common terms, would be analogous to a vSIM history on either an individual shape, a discrete mesh within the simulation space, or just a single probe. And we have all this available with a standard vSIM composer, very similar looking visualization. Now, as mentioned before, we have a bit of our own work we've written on top of the well-validated JANT4 engine. And our work is really looking at the electron volt to PEV volt level. And we look at hadronic physics, looking at decay, things of that nature, the sorts of interactions you would need for shielding applications. A similar tool that you might've heard of in the past for this type of work would be MCNP, FITS, Fluca, or Novice. Now, within RSIM, you can create any shape you would like from a geometry prim primitive. Shapes can be combined and arrayed together. So, for example, you could create a box and then say you want a 10 by 10 array of boxes out of that. And with this, you can specify them in any orientation you would want, as well as give them a thickness. So, for example, you could create a polysphere to model the shielding around an object. You can also import STL and STEP files, which are available from most CAD tools, as well as GDML files. And once they've been imported, you can say if you have a, ST, a large STL with many parts, you could split it into a couple different parts if they needed to be given a couple different materials, or examine them to see if they need to be healed. Or if you'd like to augment them, you can perform Boolean operations combining the CAD part and a constructive solid geometry piece. An example of a Boolean operation being a union, an addition, or a subtraction. So I'd mentioned there are about 700 materials in our materials database by default. And you can see here is a bit of a customization available as well. So if you wanted to create, say, in this example, we have a specific aluminum alloy, 6005 series aluminum. We can customize how much aluminum, silicon, and magnesium there happen to be in that. And with all of these materials, if you do have a very complex geometry, for example, I've worked with some of our commercial partners that had to import a CAD file with 50,000 parts in it, they can then use an external file to automatically assign all of those materials so that you can automate that task. Now in the particle sources of our sim, I'm just gonna run through these pretty quickly. You have a spherical surface is the most common as oftentimes in a space radiation environment, you'd be looking at particles coming from all sides, but we do have planar sources and point sources as well as volume sources. Once you've specified that source type, you can specify the particle that comes off of it being electrons, ions, neutrons, protons, or gammas. And with those ions, you could create a very wide range of particles, as you could imagine. You can give them an angular distribution. Uh, typically, isotropic and omnidirectional are the most common. And then you can give it a energy specification, either a monoenergetic energy, just a consistent energy, a power law, linear, exponential, or Gaussian distribution in that energy, as well as a two-column files available oftentimes for these types of simulations, there'll be a fluence and energy range 
for a range of electrons, as well as a weighted particle distribution, which is something unique to RSIM that we will be getting into in a little bit further in the presentation. And all of these particle sources, you can actually normalize your results to um, normalization, basically just looking at the normalizing out how many particles have hit it compared to how many particles exist in the simulation space. The tallies or scores, we have a wide range available. For example, our mesh, the most commonly used will be an energy or dose deposit or a particle fluence. Fluence basically tracking the number of particles that go through an object. There are a number of other tallies available as well, such as the number of tracks, number of steps, number of secondaries, all of which are available to provide a greater insight. For example, the number of secondaries will show how many secondary particles from, say, electrons impacting an aluminum block are get, end up getting created. And I did not mention here, we do have the new probe tallies. A probe is a something unique to RSIM, is a computational construct that allows you to put a small piece somewhere in the simulation and assign any material to it. Sorry, I happen to have on the next slide this probe here. For example, you can see these probes. And one of the goals of a probe is you could change the material from what the material typically is to something, if you're looking for an energy deposition or fluence, you might be more familiar with. Common example being in a, a probe could be located in somewhere that's a vacuum and you could assign it a material of aluminum or water in order to get a more realistic number of how many particles are moving through it. Because with vacuum, your energy deposition would be quite low as it's just vacuum. But the goal of these is for debugging and sort of providing insights to a simulation. They aren't quite what you would use for your results on protection. That you would want to do a volume tally. I previously mentioned the mesh tallies. And one of the great things about a mesh tally is it allows you to take a shape within RSIM, for example, and create a discretized mesh across the shape. And that'll allow you to see not this can, with a volume tally, you could see, for example, what the dose was in this part of the body on a human. And with a mesh tally, as shown here, you can see a discretization of where exactly that dose is being concentrated on the person. Geometric biasing is also something that we recently introduced with RSIM 3.0. This is something that is pretty unique and hasn't really been available within j 4. It's something unique that we've created. It's a concept that allows for the significant reduction of error in a complex shielding environment. The basic idea is that you create a number of computational spheres between the particle source and the particle target. As particles pass through the sphere, the particle splits in half. So you end up with twice as many particles at half the weight. What this does is if you have a large number of particles getting caught by an outer layer of shielding, this lets you boost the number of particles inside that thicker layer of shielding, reducing the uncertainty in your calculations as it can help give a more uniform distribution of those particles, preventing the creation of a false hot spot or false cold spot. Source biasing, also introduced with RSIN 3.0, is something that we came up with in order to help modify particle weights based on the particle energies. The idea is to sort of overemphasize particles of higher energies than you would get from a traditional simulation. This letting you run with a lot fewer particles, you can reduce your uncertainty. Now, source biasing is one that you should be careful when you're using, as it will increase your uncertainty through a thin layer of shielding, but decrease it through thicker layers of shielding. We found this to be useful when working with convergence studies. It allows you to get a rough map of where things are going much quicker because you can reduce the number of particles in your simulation by almost a factor of 10, reducing your runtime by about a factor of 10. This example here, be so this is the standard particle source. This would be your distribution of particle energies. And with the way to dis distribution. We still have a large number of these small energy particles, but we have more further out of these large energy particles being created.
Now here we've just got a quick example and show of a human in an Orion module. In this example, we've got two different step files, one being our little person there and one being our actual module, both of which we are able to just hit import and automatically available for use in our sim or any Jan4 simulation. We ended up using a weighted energy distribution in this example, with the goal being of see how, do, how good a job the Orion module does at protecting the human from external radiation. Here we can see the energy deposit on the various parts of this, our simplified human model. And you can see they're concentrated in the chest and head with smaller amounts on the arms. Now this example happens to be available with RSIM 3.0. So after this talk, if you'd like to request a trial version of RSIM, you'll be able to run this example. And at TechX, we understand that your complex problems require a comprehensive solution. Oftentimes our clients have simulation needs that are outside of the scope of any other simulation tool on the market. So we have to do some pretty intensive customer support often to make sure that you're moving down the right path with your simulation. To assist our clients in maximizing your, the value out of your software purchases, all purchases include support hours from applications engineers, as well as access to our libraries of examples, tutorials, and videos, which get updated on a regular basis as we develop new examples. And now I'll be handing it over to Arpad and Sri, who have been using RSIM for the, about, I'm not quite sure how long, a couple of months at this point, doing some work on their own application. Thank you, Peter. All right, Arpad, if you want to take over the screen. And I do want to let everybody know that if you have questions, um, there is a Q&A button on the bottom, and you can type your questions in there, and we will ask them of our panelists today. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, is the screen sharing working? It is. Let's see. We're seeing. Yep, there we go. Looks like we can see it. Perfect. Yeah. Welcome, Arpad and Srihari. Yeah. Uh, so uh, my name is uh, Arpad Lenart. Um, I'm a student at Strathclyde, as it was uh, said previously. Uh, and along with Srihari, uh, we've been working on a project where we used uh, the radiation modeling that we conducted in RSIM to um, correlate uh, the in-orbit performance analysis of a uh, live space mission that's currently orbiting uh, the Earth. Um, this project was done in collaboration with the University of Strathclyde, the uh, TechX team, uh, the Center for Quantum Technologies, and uh, spectral. So uh, first I'd like to give a, a brief overview of what we're going to be looking at. Um, first, uh, I'll provide some general context to uh, what uh, space radiation is, what are the uh, environmental hazards involved and uh, how space radiation interacts with um, uh, your electronics in general, whenever you have a space mission sent up, as well as uh, uh, go over why it's important to simulate the space radiation environment and its effects on your satellite. After, after that, we'll be um, going into the actual project that we've uh, done, where we introduced the uh, Spooky One space mission, which is the um, satellite uh, that we model the space radiation environment for, as well as uh, provide the in-orbit performance anal analysis of the Spooky One satellite. And then uh, we'll go over to how we correlated the radiation modeling that we conducted in our sim to the uh, performance analysis of this Fuki-1 satellite. So um, first of all, um, in general, whenever you have a space mission that's sent uh, into orbit, there are several environmental hazards you need to um, account for and ensure that the satellite can uh, actually survive being subjected to them. Uh, the one we're gonna be dealing with today is uh, something called uh, particle radiation. Uh, this consists of electrons, protons, and ions that bombard the spacecraft throughout its uh, lifetime. And these electrons and protons, um, they come from uh, 
the sun primarily through uh, solar winds and uh, other solar activity, such as coronal mass ejections or uh, solar flares. And um, there are also incoming particles uh, from galactic sources, such as uh, supernova events, whereby large quantities of these electrons and protons are emitted, as well as ions. Um, so for any satellite that's orbiting the Earth, um, in general, uh, these incoming particles towards the Earth, uh, they can uh, interact as long as they have a charge, they can interact with the Earth's magnetic field. And this interaction can cause um, the particles to become trapped in certain regions known as Van Allen radiation belts. Uh, within these Van Allen radiation belts, as shown in the uh, image in the middle top, or top middle, um, within these regions, these charged particles undergo a oscillation between mirror points, which are at the magnetic north and magnetic south poles. And uh, in general, their motion follows mag magnetic field lines, and their motion can be characterized by a gyration along the magnetic field lines, as well as um, by a uh, uh, oscillation and a east and westward drift perpendicular to the magnetic field lines. Now, in general, these particles are um, unavoidable. You're always going to encounter them in every space mission. However, the level of space radiation that you're actually going to encounter uh, depends on the on where you go. So it depends on the orbital altitude and the uh, inclination of your orbit. Uh, on the bottom uh, left and right images, uh, you see the trapped particle populations uh, plotted over different regions on the Earth. And um, as you can see, there are uh, quite large amounts of particles that are encountered specifically in the areas in the red circle, which is called the South Atlantic Anomaly. Um, at the magnetic uh, north and south poles, there are also large amounts of particles um, that are going to be present. Therefore, if you're going to have a polar orbit, you're going to see significantly more, or you're going to encounter significantly more particles along your path. Um, for the International Space Station, um, at 400 kilometers, here we show the number of uh, particles per unit area that are encountered from various sources on a yearly basis. The blue curve represents the number of trapped electrons uh, in the Earth's magnetic sphere um, that you're going to uh, encounter. The orange curve represents the trapped protons, how many particles you're going to encounter per unit area at various energies. Gray curve um, shows the number of uh, protons coming directly from the sun that are not trapped in the Earth's magnetic uh, field. And the yellow curve represents the particles coming from galactic sources. And as you can see, the ma two main abundant ones are going to be the trapped electrons and protons that you're actually going to encounter in low Earth orbit. Now, um, why do we really bother with this uh, space radiation in general? Uh, that's because space radiation can have devastating effects on the electronics uh, that are on board satellites. And the interactions between your particle and your electronics can be uh, characterized into two uh, main effects, if you will. Uh, which are cumulative effects, which essentially lead to the uh, degradation of the material of the electronics. And it builds up over time to a point where the instrument um, is no longer able to operate. And then there are instantaneous effects. These happen uh, immediately upon the radiation. And uh, they typically involve a uh, single particle striking a sensitive node of your electronics. For instance, um, they can change the logic gates on electronic storage devices, and this may lead to your data being corrupted or um, software failures as well. And um, as you would imagine, this is something that's quite undesirable on a space mission. 
cumulative effects, uh, they include um, primarily charge trapping and nuclear displacement. Charge trapping can occur um, inside, the semi, uh, inside the material of your electronics, uh, which tends to be typically semiconductors. Um, and for semiconductors, they're very vulnerable to this uh, charge trapping because whenever you have an incoming particle and it becomes trapped in your semiconductor, it can um, introduce newer impurities and um, as well as alter the band gap uh, energy levels uh, in your material. Then you can also have surface charging at the surface of your instrument. Uh, by the low energy particles, uh, which can cause a potential difference across your instrument, and this might damage the instrument later on. Uh, the one we're um, going to have in focus today, specifically is something called nuclear displacement or atomic displacement. Um, and it involves um, an incoming particle displacing um, an atom from its lattice location inside the uh, electronics material and um, this will introduce a lattice defect because this um, displacement atomic displacement uh, primarily depends on the particle type and energy range um, it's mostly prevalent in low energy protons those are the ones that are the main contributors to this nuclear displacement effect and over time uh, it's going to build up to such a level that the um, semiconductor or the material of your electronics is no longer able to maintain uh, the properties that it needs to have in order to function properly and hence will eventually fail. So because of this, um, you would want to have uh, shielding against these particles. However, uh, the shielding effectiveness strongly depends on what you're trying to shield against. If it's an electron or a proton and the energy ranges of these particles you're trying to shield against, as well as uh, the material type. So unfortunately, um, because these particles have large amounts of kinetic energy, um, such as for instance, protons, um, they can be very, very penetrative. So you would need upwards of um, 200 millimeters of aluminum to shield against these particles. So um, shielding against them is virtually impossible or uh, because of the uh, size and weight constraints that uh, are typical for CubeSats and other satellites. Um, yeah, so in general, the way we approximate um, penetrative uh, capabilities of these particles um, and the amount of energy uh, that they deposit is using the Bethe block equation. It um, calculates the amount of energy per unit distance that's uh, deposited by an incoming particle inside the material. For an effective shield, what you would want to have is um, most of the energy being deposited in the shield and not the electronics or instruments behind it. Um, however, there's something else that you would need to keep in mind when choosing the material that you would want to use for your shielding. And uh, that's for something called uh, secondaries. An effective shielding, um, with your goal is to minimize these incoming particles. However, um, the interaction between your shielding material and the incoming particle can sometimes result in the creation of additional particles. These are classified as secondaries. So for instance, you have one incoming um, uh, particle initially, and then after the shielding, you're gonna have three or two particles, for instance, going out of the shielding material. This is something again, undesirable. Now, um, it's also important to look at how do we quantify this radiation damage? This is very important because um, if we're unable to uh, shield against these particles, uh, we would need some ways to determine failure levels and uh, the radiation damage that gets accumulated over time. In general, we use a term called uh, radiation dose. And the typical unit for this is RADS, 
it measures the um, total energy that's deposited per unit mass of a, par uh, of a particle inside the material. Um, using simulations and theory, we can determine how much of this energy that's deposited by the incoming particle goes into what kind of effects. For instance, uh, the ionizing radiation dose would measure the number of or the total amount of energy per unit mass that goes into ionizing the atoms inside the material by the incoming particle. We can also measure uh, the energy deposited to non-ionizing effects, such as displacement damage dose. However, um, because the majority of the energy by these particles go into ionizing, into the ionizing dose, uh, we have to use uh, different units for the non-ionizing uh, radiation dose that gets uh, absorbed. And for the displacement damage, um, this is the total amount of energy per unit mass that goes into displacing atoms from their lattice locations. And it's measured in mega electron volts per gram and not joules per kilogram because it happens on a very, very uh, small scale. Now, um, every space mission design that you, uh, or every space mission uh, undergoes something called the radiation hardness assurance process. In this process, what they do is um, they have to evaluate the radiation hazards and mold, uh, specifically the radiation environment that uh, spacecraft is going to encounter. And um, using simulations, you determine the uh, average radiation level within the spacecraft that your instrument is going to encounter. Using radiation tests that were conducted on your instruments on the ground, you measure the average uh, failure level um, or uh, average uh, radiation dose at failure, at instrument failure. And by comparing these two values, you get um, something called the radiation design margin. Typically, you would want to design or have your instruments such that they can survive two times or up to three times the simulated radiation levels uh, in order to have minimal risk from uh, radiation damage induced instrument failure. So now that we've gone over the uh, provided a brief overview of uh, space radiation as a general field and uh, provided context to what it is and uh, why it's important to simulate the space radiation. Um, I'm going to, we're going to provide a uh, overview to the project, um, including the space mission that we're going to design the ra uh, radiation model for, uh, as well as uh, later on going to the actual RSIM radiation modeling and compare it to the performance analysis of the Spooky One space mission. Uh, thank you, Alfred. Uh, am I audible here? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's working. Uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. So uh, I'm Srihari. I'm a research assistant in Center of Quantum Technologies at NUS. Uh, so I'll be talking about the Spooky uh, One space mission and how it links to the to the to, to the radiation model that we are doing. Uh, so on a brief note, um, so this CubeSat was developed by uh, at Center for Quantum Technologies, and it was launched to our uh, International Space Station on 17th of April, and it was later deployed that year uh, along the ISS orbit or, or similar to ISS orbit on 17th of June 2019, and it's been still in operation until end of this year. And before going into the payload details and of how it how the instrument works. Uh, I would like to talk about the the, the mechanical st structure of the uh, of the, of the CubeSat itself. Next slide. Uh, yeah, here on the left we see the payload has been uh, the payload has been integrated into the the Com Space three uh, U uh, CubeSat, and on the right it gives us the a brief uh, idea of idea of how the payload uh, of how different materials has been, uh, it's a rough overview of how the payload has been 
uh, mounted onto the onto the satellite. Next slide. And here we see that the payload itself has uh, a different uh, materials that is that are shielding our electronics and optomet on optical units. And where we see uh, it ranges from aluminium to titanium to stainless steel and several other several other electronics. And on the left we see uh, two uh, a to add opto electronics, which are of, of our, which are of our current interest, which are APD one and APD two, which we'll go into detail a few more slides later. And as you see, we have uh, uh, the the main payload body is actually made of titanium, and also the base plate that uh, the main body sits and all the electronics is also titanium. But and also we have several other uh, structurally uh, designed. Uh, for, structure, for structural integrity, we have we have chosen to go with a stainless steel for such as you know, the mounts and the base assembly uh, that sits on th that, that that acts as an interface between the payload and the uh, the satellite's uh, chassis. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah. So this uh, on the right, you see the whole payload being integrated into the satellite and with, with the completely assembled solar panels and the antennas that you can see. On the, on the left, you see the, the CAD version of the same uh, the, the, the satellite model, which uh, gives us a, uh, an, an over, overview look of how it looks, uh, uh, how the payload looks inside the satellite. Uh, moving on. And so pr prior to, under to, to doing the gradation model, it's, uh, it's important to understand the basics of understanding of the mission, which includes the mission goals and how it's achieved and how the instrument operates and how the instrument behaves in a different uh, environment, such it could be a thermal environment or a radiation environment. So now, now we'll be talking about the actual, exp not uh, briefly talking, we'll be briefly talking about how that, what that actual experiment uh, is and how uh, how this links to the space mo the, the radiation model that we are working on, and so Spooky One has this payload called Specs, which is a small photon entangling uh, quantum system, which aims to achieve uh, uh, entangled base uh, qu quantum key distribution in space. Uh, uh, quantum a quantum using these quantum key distribution networks. Uh, this enables us to have a more secure uh, communication between any two parties, uh, which involves uh, detecting of two entangled uh, photon pairs, oh, uh, or 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 one entangled photon pairs, which is like two photons. And on 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 this op optical schemat schematic diagram, you see the number one on the left is the laser diode, which uh, which shoots out sh shoots out the laser beam at a particular wavelength, and it all uh, it passes through several uh, crystals, and it reaches uh, the, our optoelectronic number fifteen on each end of the arm, which is the uh, single uh, which is a silicon based avalanche photodiode. And these avalanche photodiodes are detects the incoming photon. Uh, obviously, they are they are made of. Uh, uh, the active region of, uh, sorry, uh, am I still audible? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's working. Uh, okay. So these uh, single uh, silicon-based uh, sing uh, avalanche photodiodes are, uh, are use a positive negative junction-based semiconductor with a reverse bias voltage uh, that exceeds the breakdown voltage. Meaning, when when there's an income when, when there is an incoming photon that incidents on the active region of the uh, of the of the sensor, uh, it generates a charge carrier through a process called photoelectric effect, and thus we we detect this the this we detect a single photon that has been incident. So this is how we detect it. So, but uh, this uh, there's also another issue here is that these single for these APDs. Uh, or avalanche photodiodes uh, can also uh, have a, a false detection, meaning uh, when when there is when there even when when there are no uh, incident photons, there will be a, sometimes th there could be a, an electron hole pair generation due to thermal uh, in environment of the APD itself. 
So these are these false detection are called dark counts. Uh, moving on. So these fo false photons. So these dark counts are not desirable for us because it uh, it reduces the entanglement quality of our ex of, of our uh, of, of of our experiment, which which thereby reduces a particular uh, parameter that we call as uh, a quantum key uh, uh, generator. And we would like to ha have this dark counts as minimal as possible. And a, a, a temperature is also uh, is is a is a main contribution of these dark uh, uh, is one of the main contributes contribution for these dark counts. Uh, next slide. Uh, here we see the uh, one of the uh, the data sheets from of the one of the APDs that we use, and uh, which which shows the temperature dependencies of the dark counts, and and you see on the red curve uh, the for the two curves represent uh, of APDs at a different voltage operating at a different voltage have a, a temp uh, have have a temperature dependency uh, the dark counts and and the the dependency is exponential. So we would like to have uh, as low. Uh, we would like to achieve a low dark counts, and which, which means we should also make sure uh, the temperature is. Uh, we should also consider the temperature environment of the satellite or whatever the measurements that we are doing uh, as well. Uh, next slide. Yeah. So now we know how dark how the dark counts are related to to the temperature in environment. Now coming in, coming to the spookies uh, in orbit data, uh, uh, among other uh, experimental data that we collected, dark on data is all, we have also collected dark on measurements over the whole mission period and for seven nineteen days for seven hundred and nineteen days, and on the bottom left two graphs graphs say that uh, it, it's it's a plot of a dark of dark on's measurement uh, as a function of its own temperature. Uh, meaning each data point is uh, so, so we collect these data for each orbital days on each orbital day on each orbital day uh, days uh, and for each orbital we plot this a uh, dark one versus temperature plot and which which fall which obeys a, an exponential relation and from these exponential relation we extrapolate the dark ones measured at a particular uh, temperature and we monitor the dark ones uh, um, we monitor the dark count at this normalized temperature over the whole uh, mission period, which, which which is what we plot. We see the uh, we, which is so which is what we see on the graph on the right uh, side, where we see the APD two and APD one has has an the, the rate of increase in dark counts is uh, is higher up, up until four, around four fifty days uh, four fifty orbital days, and after that we see a reduced uh, reduction in the rate of increase in dark counts. And we also note, note that APD2 has a higher uh, dark count uh, detection uh, than APD1. And since uh, a temperature is also a, a key uh, uh, in a parameter that influences dark count here, we need to make sure whatever dark counts that, may, that we are uh, experiencing and whatever uh, radiation model that we are trying to do, sh sh we should also eliminate or omit, uh, make sure that there are the temperature um, we should also eliminate such uh, to make sure that there are no uh, or there are um, we, we should also try to we should also try to eliminate uh, uh, we should also sorry uh, we should also make sure that the influence of temperature is also at the minimum because we want to make sure the radiation model that we are doing has a has a good confidence level as at the end of the day uh, so on the left on left we see the maximum gradient observed across the payload over the whole uh, mission period, uh, and we see we, uh, we see an average of uh, a average of less than two degrees gradient across the payload. So, which means this could not uh, uh, this could not high likely be the main reason for the the increase in dark on that we that we experienced for APD two compared to APD one. And speaking of temperature, since we are in orbit, we should also make sure having uh, the exposure time in, in the sun could also increase uh, uh, the temperature of the satellite. Um, 
uh, which means we sh uh, on, on the right on second plot we see uh, the exposure uh, the, the sun's exposure plot across the orbital days and we do not see a significant a uh, similar trend in the dark one plot as uh, in the dark ones above uh, where we see up, up for up to for about 20 we for each peak of 25 hours sun exposure we don't see, we do not see a similar trend in the dark one as well so this could mean this there is sun's exposure is not is highly likely a, a contributor to the dark count rate that we are seeing and what what are what another um good uh, or what another uh, point to, to be noted here is that the altitude drop uh, on the right bottom we see uh, right bottom is the altitude drop of our spooky sat over uh, the 700 days in, in orbit and from the similar of uh, from the point of 450 to 500 the, the altitude drop is is steeper than uh, before so this could also this also in, could in, in, indicate this could also the the reason for i mean post 450 days in the dark one plot above uh, the reduction in this in this, the slope of the uh, uh, of the of each uh, plot uh, could also indicate that it could be due to the drop in the altitude so this this kind of correlates that the reason in the uh, the reason for drop in the rate of increase in dark counts for each APDs is could be due to the drop in the altitude. Uh, uh, moving on. Yeah. Uh, now, yeah. Now my my colleague uh, Arpad will talk about how how the radiation um, contributions to con contributes to the dark count. Uh, right. Um, so. In order to understand the spooky behavior of these uh, instruments on board the Spooky One satellite, um, of why we have higher dark count rates in our APD2 uh, APD detector, um, there are three factors that can contribute to this effect in increased dark count rates. Uh, one of them is temperature, uh, which has a significant impact on it, as uh, Shrihari mentioned. Uh, then there are two other ones uh, which are radiation induced, um, namely the ionizing radiation dose that is absorbed by the APDs and the displacement damage uh, dose. So um, in general, the ionizing radiation in order to affect uh, the, op the dark count rates of our APDs, you would need thousands of rads of radi ionizing radiation dose. Uh, in order to have uh, just an increase in a, a few um, tens of kilocounts per second. Now, um, on the image on the right, uh, this is shown, and uh, it is the um, it shows a figure of the uh, SAP 500, which is a type of detector that we've used for the Spooky One satellite. Uh, being subjected to ionizing uh, gamma radiation tests uh, that were conducted by the National University of Singapore. Um, so in general, we would have very, very large ionizing radiation requirements uh, in order to see substantial uh, differences in the dark count rates of our APDs. Also note the linear dependence of uh, the dark count rates on the total ionizing dose. Um, then there is displacement damage dose. Um, there is also radiation testing conducted on the displacement damage doses for our instruments uh, for the SAP 500. Um, both theoretical approximations as well as um, the radiation tests suggest that there is a linear relationship between the induced, the radiation induced dark count rates and the uh, accumulated displacement damage dose. Um, on the figure on the right, you see uh, the displacement damage dose tests that were conducted by the uh, Crocker Nuclear Laboratory. There were 12 devices used in total, and they were subjected to various, by various beams to simulate various levels of displacement damage. Um, because of this linear relationship, we can uh, use the ratios in the dark count rates uh, for our APDs, APD one and two. And um, if the dark counts are displacement damage induced, then you can equate this dark count rate ratio with the 
accumulated displacement damage, those ratios. And um, if, the if the dark count rates is uh, radiation induced, then these two ratios should be equivalent. Now, um, before we go on to an actual radiation model, uh, it's important to account for the limitations of our, um, of our theory, um, namely the rela linear relationship between the displacement damage dose that's accumulated over, over time and the accumulated dark count rates. It's important to point out uh, that for short mission durations and small radiation doses, uh, this linear relationship does not hold. And um, this is both uh, seen uh, in the radiation tests um, that were conducted, which is shown on the uh, image on the left. You can see how for small uh, radiation fluences, um, you have some discrepancy in the induced radiation-induced dark counts. Um, the reason for this behavior is that um, this is a commercially off-the-shelf component, the SAP 500, and it's not uh, radiation hardened, meaning that it wasn't designed uh, for a space radiation environment uh, initially. But that does not mean it can't be used uh, in, a, in a space radiation environment. On the image on the right, we have uh, all of the dark count rates. Uh, for both the APD1 and 2 detectors normalized to uh, 10 degrees Celsius. And as you can see, um, the short-term linear fit and the long-term linear fit of our dark count rates are uh, uh, in disagreement. And that's because uh, we cannot predict the radiation-induced dark count rates for small time durations. Also, it's important to note that um, in the first 200 days, we have a lack of data points available. So we cannot get a, um, an accurate uh, linear trend line uh, or, a, or a fit uh, for the first 200 days. So we cannot model our dark count rate ratios within that period uh, with high levels of confidence. Um, yeah. So, now that we've introduced the space mission, the problem that was um, observed on board, as well as the uh, in-orbit performance analysis, it's time to delve into the uh, arson radiation modeling that we conducted for the Spooky One satellite. So um, first of all, I'd like to mention the benefits of using um, arson uh, for radiation modeling. Um, one of these ones is uh, the fact that we can actually have a high fidelity three-dimensional CAD model of the satellite to model uh, the interaction between the space radiation environment and the satellite. And uh, this is very important to have this uh, high fidelity model because uh, it will include all of the structural shielding effects of nearby components, as well as all of the possible uh, particle entry angles into the satellite and into our instruments. Moreover, um, because of uh, the fact that it accounts for this uh, structural shielding effects, um, it's actually going to be able to measure the rate or simulate the radiation doses with significantly higher accuracy. Uh, whereas if you were to use simplified one dimensional models, you're likely to have an unrealistic radiation dose calculated and you're likely to overestimate the radiation dose that you're. Uh, instrument is going to be subjected to. Um, moreover, for radiation hardness assurance processes, it allows you to um, simulate the space radiation uh, effects or the level space radiation levels within your spacecraft much more accurately, allowing you to achieve lower radiation margins, um, which may uh, reduce uh, the costs as well as the uncertainty uh, involved in your radiation model. Uh, also, um, modeling through RSIM allows us to do a fully detailed analysis of the radiation exposure on a particle origin, type, and energy um, basis. Yeah. So first of all, um, there are some goals that we'd like to achieve with our radiation model. Um, one of them is to use a high fidelity uh, model of the satellite to conduct our radiation analysis. And 
we would want to use this to demonstrate that there are actually ex radiation exposure differences uh, for the two detectors on board the satellite and uh, try and correlate this um, to the uh, dark count rates that are that have been observed from the in-orbit data. Um, also, we would want to model um, the variables to which our um, uh, electronics or the APDs are susceptible to, uh, namely the displacement damage and the ionizing dose from electrons over the entire orbital lifetime. Now, because the ionizing dose has minimal contribution to the dark count rates, we're going to try to see what happens in a worst case scenario where we have a large abundance of these electrons, hence large uh, ionizing radiation dose uh, in the instruments and see if in the worst case scenario, could ionizing effects be responsible for the performance differences. So the way we would go about doing this um, in RSIM is to first off start off with the um, high fidelity CAD model of our satellite. Um, we would want to, to optimize for performance in RSIM. We would want to remove the negligible components. These includes uh, screws and other small components which cannot impact our simulation in any way. Um, then we take that uh, modified CAD model and we import it into RSIM. Uh, I would like to quickly note that uh, removing these negligible components like screws is optional. We don't necessarily have to do it. Uh, yeah. So once you imported your uh, CAD model into RSIM, then you would need to import your differential emission fluences that, or the radiation environment which your satellite's going to uh, um, be subjected to. So then the next thing that you need to look at is your mission requirements. What are the susceptibilities of your hardware? What variables you need to model and set up the, your uh, RSIM radiation model uh, accordingly? And the next step is um, to optimize uh, the simulation parameters in order to achieve low errors and uh, minimal computational power requirements, and hence, in the end, achieve reliable results. So I like to show these uh, five uh, relatively simple steps of what they look like uh, in RSIM. Uh, so this is what it would look like, uh, the user interface looks like once you imported the uh, CAD model of your satellite. As you can see um, on the left column here, you have all of the CAD components listed. If they are full of screws, it will make it difficult for you to find various components. So that's why I would also uh, recommend removing them, negligible ones. The next step would be to assign the materials to the CAD components um, on a component to component basis. And uh, you can do that by the, uh, um, the material database that's provided in the software, as well as you could define your own materials um, in case if something's missing. So once we uh, did that, we need to set up our radiation source. Um, so based on the telemetry data from the satellite, uh, it was shown that the satellite is actually tumbling and has no preferential orientation. Therefore, even in the event, if the um, space radiation environment had some directionality associated with it, meaning that you have more particles coming from one direction, over time, because the satellite is tumbling, um, the effects will be canceled out, if you will. Uh, so it is safe to assume that we have a omnidirectional uh, angular distribution for our particles, meaning that we have the same amount of particles coming from all directions. The way we define uh, our, or import, the way we import our differential emission fluences into RSIM, uh, we did that using a two column text file uh, here's what it looks like on the bottom left and the bottom right image, sorry. Um, it's, a, on, it's a tabulated two column text file. And on the left column, you have the particle energy and mega electron modes and on the right column, the differential fluence that you're gonna have. 
So the next step is to set up your tallies. This includes volume and mesh tallies according to the mission requirements, as well as the radiation uh, modeling goals that you have. So we would want to um, first show that there are differences in radiation exposure, and we would want to identify whether this comes from primary or secondary particles. We also want to find out whether this is from uh, protons or electrons in the model, and we'd also like to identify the energy range um, where this uh, difference in radiation exposure uh, uh, is present. So using volume tallies, we can set up um, uh, the, these uh, dose tallies, if you will, and uh, set them according to this small table here uh, on the right, where we would measure the radiation dose contributions from various particle types and various energy ranges. Um, and in order to measure the displacement damage dose, uh, which we're, we uh, need to measure it based on the susceptibilities from the mission requirements for the instruments, um, we will be measuring the proton fluences into both APDs. From this, we get a energy spectrum for these fluences. Um, and we also, to assess general uh, radiation exposure analyses, we use heat maps, uh, where we measure the total particle fluences. And, the sec and uh, we look at where the secondary particles were actually generated. Uh, is what the mesh tile looks like and how you can assign uh, the grids. Yeah, the next step, the final step is to optimize your simulation. Uh, this involves uh, getting the right number of uh, primary particles in your simulation, um, whether you want to use geometric biasing. In this case, we did have to use geometric biasing to achieve uh, much lower uh, simulation errors. And then you would also want to optimize the physics and electromagnetic models that you use according to your application that you're using. Um, yeah. So um, you also would like to uh, say how we calculate the displacement damage doses. So as I mentioned previously, we've looked at the proton fluences into our APD CAD components. And uh, what you could do is you could export this from RSEM and uh, plug it into this uh, screen relativistic uh, displacement damage dose calculator. Um, in case if anyone is familiar with it, European Space Agency has a tool to uh, uh, estimate one dimensional models only for displacement damage doses. And they use the same approach in their calculations. So this is a very reliable uh, calculator. Now, going on over to the results section. Um, first, we are presenting the general radiation exposure analysis. And on a yearly basis, if we assume that the satellite is at an altitude of 408 kilometers, on a yearly basis, on average, um, based on the heat maps of the total particle fluences across the uh, internal areas of the satellite, we see a hot spot in the location of APD2 and a cold spot in the location of APD1. APD2 is marked with a black circle, APD1 is uh, marked with a blue circle. Um, and we see that APD2 is subjected to approximately or almost twice higher total particle fluences. In the figure on the right, we see the, hit, uh, the heat map of where the secondary particles were generated by protons. And from this graph, it's evident, or sorry, figure, it's evident that um, the two APDs were actually subjected to equivalent amounts of secondary particles. And uh, no major differences could be um, observed. You also can see that uh, in some components, you had significantly more secondary particles that were generated than in other parts of the spacecraft. Um, on the table on the top right, we see uh, on the particle type and energy basis, basis um, uh, the radiation dose contributions to both APD1 and the APD2 detectors. 
And uh, primary differences were evident in the low and medium energy protons as well as electrons. Uh, the more energetic particles, you see more equivalent uh, uh, radiation exposures. And the reason for that is they're highly penetrative. So independent of the shielding, they'll still get through and deposit energy. Now, um, it was mentioned by Shrihari that there is an altitude drop on the satellite. And we would want to account for this uh, altitude drop. So what we've done is, uh, over the 600 days in orbit, we split this up into 100 day segments, mission segments. And in each 100 day mission segment, we separately um, measured or simulated the um, uh, mission differential fluences and uh, modeled in our sim the, uh, the displacement damage dose and the electron irradiation dose within each hundred day segments separately. In the bottom left figure, we see how uh, over the 600 days, uh, the displacement damage dose accumulates in both sensors. And uh, the differences are substantial between them. And the same goes for accumulated electron dose. Um, the electrons primarily, they deposit almost all of their energy to ionizing radiation. And the maximum differences in this uh, ionizing radiation dose is uh, 300 rads. And uh, 300 rads is not enough to cause more than a couple of uh, kilocounts per second differences in the uh, dark arrays of our sensors. Now it's important to, so now that we ruled out ionizing uh, uh, those as a possible factor in the uh, uh, increased dark count rates for one of our detectors. Um, it is, we're going to focus on the displacement damage dose. Uh, we need to validate our results first. And um, it turns out that the in orbit data, the simulated displacement damage doses, and the displacement damage dose radiation tests on the ground, they're all in agreement. Um, the relationship between the dark count rates and the time uh, in orbit is linear in approximately in the first 550 days. Um, and the simulated displacement damage though seems to be in agreement because um, by the end of the 600 days, we were able to determine the 10% simulation error that displacement damage doses are 0.9 and 1.4 times 10 to the six mega electron moles per gram. Based on the displacement damage of radiation tests, this would um, uh, correlate to slightly less than 200 kilocounts per second dark count rates and almost 400 kilocounts per second uh, dark count rates, which is actually the levels of dark counts that we're observing uh, at the same temperature on board uh, the uh, Spooky One satellite. Um, Note that there's some statistical variations in the uh, displacement damage radiation tests. That's because of the small batch sizes that were used. Only 12 devices were tested. Uh, yeah, but nevertheless, the results are still in agreement. Now we would want to uh, look at how um, we could correlate these radiation results with the measured dark count rate ratios um, in short-term, mid-term, and long-term um, time durations. And um, however, unfortunately, because uh, it, as it was mentioned in the first, in the first hundred days, we cannot get a accurate um, relationship between uh, the dark count rates and the displacement damage dose cannot model accurately for that time period. And in the first 200 days, we have a lack of data. So we can only correlate the dark count rate ratios and the displacement damage dose ratios after 300 days, because that's when we have sufficient enough uh, uh, measurements in order to make a conclusive dark count rate uh, ratio. Yeah, uh, Shari? Uh, yeah, so to briefly summarize what our whole project ha 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 has been done for until now is that 
uh, on from spooky data's cat model so as arpit told me he has we are, so we have been able to uh, first gener generate a general model which is uh, not so complex so we fix the altitude with, with, from, and from the spend versus particle fluence data for our particular orbit and time frame we incorpor incorporated that into the rsim models and we found we we, we got the ionizing the dose ratio yeah, ionized total ionizing doses and also we evaluate we evaluated the radiation uh, uh, exposures and su such as where we we we, we conclude that a uh, total ionizing dose does not uh, have a significant uh, effect as compared to a displacement dose damage and we move forward to our sim advanced uh, model where we calculate we incorporate the altitude drop as well into the particle fluence data from the, that we get from uh, spenders and incorporate incorporate into uh, the rsim uh, mo model and from there we we get this we we go we move ahead with the splitting of into six segments where we we monitor the displacement dose ratio across uh, the six segments and we try to correlate with our measured real uh, with, with the real measurement done on on the satellite and in parallel we have from the from the spooky's dark count data what we did is we we first uh, uh, plotted out the dark count trends uh, with as a function of its own temperature and from the exponential fit we extrapolated the dark count rates to a normalized uh, temperature and monitored that particular uh, dark for that normal normalized temperature monitor the dark count rates how it evolves over uh, the 700 days uh, mission time and over this uh, after doing this we are uh, we more have maybe more more on with six segment uh, model where we try to correlate uh, with the dark with, with the displacement dose ratio model that, uh, that we got from this rsim uh, model and we see that uh, after 300 days uh, of orbital time we see a, as a, as a, as a comparable correlation between uh, the the simulated dark count rate dark count rate ratio, uh, sorry simulated uh, dark count rate ratio sorry simulated disc, displacement dose damage ratio to our measured uh, dark count rate ratios uh, so in summarize the, this in this essentially builds confident uh, to our radiation modeling uh, procedure or approach uh, using arsen and yeah so nokark no, arpad will talk about the key uh, takeaways uh, of this uh, project so uh, in general um, the key takeaways are that uh, we can actually use uh, the high fidelity uh, three dimensional radiation modeling of uh, um, radiation modeling to predict in-orbit satellite performance. And we can do this with uh, relatively high accuracy. Um, however, to do this, you would require basic understanding of the instrument behavior and the susceptibilities uh, of your uh, uh, instrument in the radiation environment. And most important of all, you would require a uh, accurate uh, mission fluences for the mission duration that you have. We simulated the mission fluences uh, for uh, the past days, so it actually accurately accounted for uh, solar activity. Um, during solar activity, the radiation fluences can change. Um, high fidelity models um, also allowed us to compete a very wide array analysis um, uh, in very high detail. Um, we were able to assess whether it's primary particles and we also uh, narrowed everything down to interactional type um, that's behind uh, the observed um, uh, performance on the satellite and we also narrowed this down to particle type and energy basis so in general we were able to demonstrate how this could be used to understand uh, the performance uh, of current space missions. However, um, I'm sure you could also use this for radiation hardness assurances as it allows accurate measurements of the radiation doses that you're going to see uh, and accurate uh, um, 
and other accurate uh, variables such as displacement damage, those calculations that you're likely to observe in orbit. Uh, I would like to acknowledge the uh, support of the uh, TechX team, Peter Nelson and Colleen Dunn. Uh, I would also like to thank the uh, Spectral team, uh, including Hua Yi Yang, as well as the Center for Quantum Technologies team, uh, including Shrihari Shivanash Karan and Professor Alexander Ling, as well as uh, Professor Bernard Hidding and Dr. Daniel Oy for their extensive support from University of Strathclyde. I would also like to thank the Spooky One Space Mission team who uh, realized the Spooky One Space Mission, as well as um, I'd like to acknowledge the funding provided by uh, the UK National Quantum Technologies Program and uh, Quantum Technology Hub in Quantum Technology uh, in Quantum Communications, sorry, for their uh, funding for this project. Uh, now comes the Q&A section. <laughs> wow, that was awesome, you guys. Thank you so much for such a beautifully, yeah, I mean, what a great presentation. So um, we have some time for uh, just a few questions if anyone wants to type them in. I do see one here. Um, this is for uh, our patent tree, Hari, just asking, there's actually a series. <laughs> um, uh, how did Arsim benefit your team over using uh, GIANT4? Like, you know, what improvements were you able to make? Uh, How did you find that was helpful for you? Right. Um, okay. So um, initially, one thing which I've shown um, is that uh, using RSIM, uh, we were able to um, get much more accurate displacement damage dose uh, simulations. Uh, if we wouldn't have used uh, this high fidelity modeling, we would significantly have um, uh, simulated increased, uh, almost six times higher yearly displacement damage doses um, for our instruments. And also um, there were some issues uh, when we attempted to recreate these uh, results obtained from RSIM using one dimensional models. Uh, from each shielded uh, direction. And uh, ARSIM turned out to provide much better uh, uh, or more accurate uh, radiation dose measurements for this. So it actually proved to be very beneficial. It also proved to be beneficial as uh, there was an understanding um, of the particle uh, uh, interactions that were responsible for the radiation uh, exposure differences. Initially, it was thought that secondary particles would be responsible for uh, the observed behavior on Spooky One. So um, they were able to uh, figure out uh, the actual reason behind the uh, radiation exposure differences. And uh, Shrihari, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Uh, I think you just pointed out the right ones. Uh because we, we, we have a geometrical differences in the positioning of the APT. So I think this was, uh, and I personally think, I personally think the, the felt that this uh, modeling of using ASM had a, a, that's a slight benefit over uh, other, other models, yeah, other platforms to be exact. Yeah. Was there anything that would prevent you from just using JAMP4? Um, but we haven't used other uh, types of um, uh, simulation software or other uh, radiation codes. Um, so we initially uh, decided to stick with John 4 um, because it proved to be a reliable uh, radiation transport model. Um, we haven't explored too much into the other ones. I mean, the European Space Agency has a SPENVIS tool um, or the Space Environment Information System tool. Sure. And that's already uh, considered a golden standard. And it also uses this John 4 model. But the RSIM provides a much, much more detailed uh, modeling uh, capabilities. So that's why we've stuck with John 4 and uh, used RSIM. Um, and did you ever look at just using John? I mean, it sounds like you use this over SpendVis, but did you ever just look at using the code? 
So if we actually use the code itself. Yeah, I didn't know if there was, um, the question is just kind of asking if you had ever looked at, you know, just using kind of the, the pure giant without using either Spenvis or some other kind of wrapper with it, but it doesn't sound like you had actually tried uh, that. No. Great. Okay. Um, another question is for radiation hardness assurance, does your computational application have to be certified? Um, certified uh, in the sense that um, by the European Space Agency or NASA or? I think just trying to, is that something that you come across where people state that you have to have that? Um, if that was something you, you know, that you saw that you. Right. Um, so what I've done uh, initially is um, I did some benchmarking using RSEM. So um, I used uh, the European Space Agency's or ESA's spend this tool as a, because that's already a golden standard that's widely accepted. Uh, I've recreated the same linear one-dimensional models in RSIM as I did in SPENVIS and the radiation dose measurements were the same for those. So um, that's what I use to verify that the measurement or the simulations I'm doing in RSIM actually are accurate and uh, are working as intended. And uh, assuming that it works in one dimension, it should also work in three dimensions. Sure, sure. Um, we have another question just asking about what was the learning curve for our sim? How easy would it be to change the flux over time of particles from your source representing solar emission? Like to take account of solar flares and sunspots? Uh, it's relatively easy. All you really need to do is uh, change the uh, column, uh, the tabulated to column text file uh, to account for the new mission fluence and literally rerun the simulation again. Um, so changing it for another space mission uh, or changing the space mission fluences is relatively easy. Okay. It's quite, quite easy. It's just changing a text file for the learning curve. Um, I guess the, uh, it doesn't take too long to get familiar with uh, the software because uh, it's quite intuitive to use. Uh, the main uh, difficult part is uh, actually optimizing the simulation, um, but you can get that uh, done within fairly short amounts of time. Okay. And I think I have time for one more question, which says, can the, um, gosh, I'm probably gonna state incorrectly, can the Beth Block equation compute deposition in flesh? Uh, I think so. Um, I think you do need some uh, additional correction terms for uh, use in human tissue. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I would use a beta block mainly as, a, um, as an approximation. So I would be more reliant on the actual uh, more accurate radiation models. Uh, there are several corrections that need to be um, made for the beta block in order to be used for some applications like mod corrections or for certain, certain uh, elements, for instance. Okay. So if one was using it for, you know, predicting deposition for cancer treatment, you would have to take into account those corrections. Uh, right. Right. Okay. Okay. Gosh, I think that's, that's good. We're coming up on our next presentation. Um, uh, if anyone has additional questions, anything that they weren't able to ask today, you can email us at techx at sales at txcorp.com. And we will make sure to get the questions over to either Peter or Arpad or Srihari um, and get those back to you. But this was really, you guys did a great job. Um, thank you so much for talking. Um, we, I also want to let you know that if uh, everybody watching, if you would like to have a free 30-day evaluation of our sim so you can play with it yourself and see um, kind of experience the learning curve and the ease. Your, um, just request that from us as well on our website at txcorp.com. There is an evaluation form and we can certainly set that up and get you the latest version to try out yourself for 30 days of our sim three. So um, coming up next, we have Dr. Svetlana Shasharina. She's going to be talking about using vSIM for photonics. And she'll be up here, gosh, in about six minutes. So if everyone wants to take a quick break, I will see you all again uh, at 1130. Thanks so much, you guys. That was really great.